So I think even without a single word of introduction, everyone knows Tarun's legacy, Tarun's story. And so we're going to jump straight into it. So Tarun, we see you here today at the top of your game, a legend. Tell us about the fashion industry when you started. Because it was in quite a nascent stage, what, 35, 40 years ago? Like, what is the difference that you see? Well, well you know, we had just come out, or we were petering out of India being socialist, which was the need after partition. And, you know, the Maharajas had lost their privy purses, and they were the real patrons of really fine craft and jewelry and all the really over-the-top luxury, which India was well known for. And also, the government, the emergency, made it unfashionable to be fashionable, if that makes sense. So one had to kind of invoke a certain dowdiness, low-key. Taxes sometimes went to 98%. That's why Indians love black money. I mean, you couldn't pay 98% or 101% tax. And all this happened. But suddenly in the 80s, you know, there was, the, I think, the Asian Games, color television came in. When I moved back from the States, there was one serial, you know, the bold and the beautiful that India, at least urban India stopped to watch. Yeah, I am old enough to remember yeah, that. Yeah, well, I mean, many people here who aren't. And so it was really like creaking into a new life. And we started this thing because we'd see all these beautiful things that were sold abroad and they weren't available in India. And I said, you know, 40 years after independence, are we still taking our best product to the white man? And we Indians shopped at Fashion Street, which basically meant export rejects, because we were a textile industry until this time. Women wore saris, men had switched more to Western clothes to get ahead in the Western English-speaking world, but most women still wore saris. You know, the choli was made by your tailor, and if I, I keep saying, when I, 200 years back, if I landed off a parachute, I would know what part of the country I was in just by the way people draped their fabric on their body. So even if they were wearing white, the Bengalis would wear the sari differently from the Maharashtrian and to the Kurgi. So even the drape, and men too, in their dhotis, lungis, shawls, safas, turbans, it was just fabric. You and I could have shared a churida with a nara because they were this big. <laughs> I'll and take your word for that, Tarun. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll try that afterwards. So basically, we were really at a change in India today, this great story on the new fashion kind of consciousness and Rohit Khosla had style, Feroz Gujral in a dhoti with a jacket and a turban. Very much like you look, it was very cool. And so he, you know, it was, and there were a few boutiques. So we started to say to people, why don't we start a store where we bring the best of Indian design? Let Indians who are designing for Western brands develop their own language. Let Western brands working with Indian craftsmanship show here. And we were lucky to have a kind of old rental space that was, you know, didn't cost much. So we could afford the experiment. And it just was at the right moment at the right time. We didn't make money. We had no idea of merchandising. But it was just like something falling at the right time. It was like a bomb. And it went viral, you know, and people knew about it worldwide. And it was just an exciting moment because we had gone from being a textile in that country into Indian fashion being fashioned out of Indian textiles in a modern way or in a tailored way, let's say. You know, it's interesting you say that because I think Indian women have supported uh, the growth of the Indian fashion industry in that they have not adopted an entirely Western approach ever, right? So why do you think that is, that they, they haven't blindly followed Western fashion? Well, because firstly, they look much better in Indian clothes and they're not stupid. Mm -hmm. But also, <laughs> also, most Western fashion isn't relevant here. It's made, as we know it, for cold climates. There's nothing in the West in winter that you can wear. I mean, maybe Jaipur, Delhi, because it's cold. It's not cut for the Indian body, the body structures. And the big problem today is that even our magazines are so derivative that it's putting Indian women into a crisis. Because still the magazines came, Indian women were just comfortable being Indian. Indian men who were much more Western are becoming more Indian. And I think it also speaks about the confidence that India, Indians have and Indians. And, you know, you've got wonderful brands like Anoki, for instance, that make accessible fashion. Fashion in the Western construct is different. The fabrics are different. The climate is different. Their bodies are different. And you see a, it's a big problem now in urban India. You go out. When I moved to Delhi, everyone wore Indian clothes at dinner. Now they're all stuffed into these dresses. I don't know where they come from. But with Indian <laughs> saddlebags and the whole thing, it's not appropriate. You look amazing in a simple drape. We draped over the body. If three women walk into a room wearing the same Prada, there's they have a crisis. But if three of you women wear the same sari, just because of your body contours and the way you have the freedom to change it, 
it can look completely different. And that's the beauty of the draped form. So, so Tarun, you're also, uh, let's talk about here the concept sari in that case. I don't know what we're all going to do with our grandmother's saris now that we're all... Well, by then the tailors will have figured out how to make them into concept <laughs> saris for you. And actually, you know, so after this whole puritanical 70s, 80s, a lot of young girls, lifestyle had changed, right? My grandmother swam in a sari. She thought it was normal. She did everything in a sari, but she never left the house. You know, it was a different life. Today, people are taking trains, jumping, going to work, blah, blah, blah. My mother would come back from work, she'd change. She'd change at night. So three yeah, times a course. day, saris had to be starched and pressed. It's all practical. So it's partly that. So the concept sari was, as we learned structure, to take Indian drapes. Everyone thinks of India as color, which it is, amazingly. Embroidery. But it's the way Indians drape fabric that's the most beautiful thing. And we are losing it. Because, I mean, I tried to wear a dhoti once. It was too uncomfortable. I don't know what to do with this, the evening yeah, method. Concept dhoti next yeah, time. Well, yeah. we do have the concept dhoti now with the fly. So I always said, people, don't worry. You can go, you can party, and you can lift up your kutta, and you can find it to pee. You don't have to unravel the whole damn thing. You've got to be practical. Fashion, you have to live your life in fashion, right? And as lifestyle changes, well, fashion has to be different. So like the rest of the world, we found the structured drape, and now there's technique, and Indian designers have trained abroad and come back, and we get Italian pattern cutters. So the concept sari was just one of these many iterations for you to look like you're in a sari, but on a zipper. So you can do what you want and do a cartwheel and get trashed and you're fine. Nothing's going to fall off. <laughs> always always yeah. a good thing. I mean, don't always joke. a good thing, don't right? Joke. <laughs> always a good thing. You know, but I want to ask you about uh, the Tarun Tahiliani bride. Now tell me, is she a bridezilla? Well, it takes all types to be, but more and more, they're less bridezilla. They're highly educated. They're traveled. They want to wear one necklace. They want to keep their hair open. There was a point eight, five, ten, eight years back, I think the pandemic changed a bit of that. It just made people, allowed them to be a little more shanti, you know. But there was so much pressure and they'd come and say, I want to be like Joda Akbar, and I mean, it was like retarded. <laughs> and the jewels went to here and then I've seen brides weeping because they can't walk, because they're laying us 30 kilos and it's, they're bleeding and they're exhausted by the time. So, really you know, recommending marriage here, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you get through this, you definitely want to be married. So it's like the final hurdle, you know, the obstacle race. Uh, but I think it's changing fast. As women are educated and calm and good in their own skin, they have less of a need to project. I think that was from a different time. You know, I read, uh, you wrote in your book that your mother was an engineer. Yeah. And that you only knew modern emancipated women. It's right? true. And that obviously would reflect on your muses and your, and your work. Absolutely. Yeah. But interestingly, another thing I read, sorry, I'm quoting you here, men don't want to suffer in the name of beauty. Would you say women are also emancipating themselves out of this Well, they trap? still suffer a lot more, and maybe it's just the way they've been socialized, and they do have the ability to transform themselves, I mean, uh, which men don't. So the maximum a groom will do is wear the safa and suffer it. Mm -hmm. But everything else, and you know, people, I hear this all the time, they'll come and say, oh my God, we didn't know that Indian clothes could be so comfortable. And I said, just because we Indians didn't know technique, the tailors didn't know how to put a sleeve in, or these are things that are very technical. So, well, men globally won't suffer as much. I mean, it's also the way we've been socialized, they went out, they worked, they had a hundred things. Women have a lot of pressure when they're working now, but women like to feel good. And the woman who enjoys getting dressed up is doing it for herself, not for 100 other people. This is absolutely true. So that's absolutely. it, you know, you're doing it for yourself, good for you. <laughs> Minal Modi say, I get a drink, I play Aretha Franklin, and I slowly go by and I say a little prayer for you, please. It was her production and she loved it. Why not? Um, so, you know, in this digital age, there's an obliteration of failure. We only see images of people's success. Look, I won this award. Look, my children are so cute. Look, I look so pretty at my wedding. It's endless, right? And I'm guessing to get where you did, you had a lot of roadblocks, a lot of stumbling blocks. A again. lot, yeah. because we were And trained. people don't know about that, right? So why don't you tell us about some bloopers then? <laughs> yeah, okay. I mean, we knew nothing when we started. I mean, honestly, we just started a store. And we followed Rohit Khosla, who was a great designer right. and a mentor who passed away. Uh, and he had worked in, you know, he'd studied abroad and worked with Versace. And he was just kind and generous. And he would teach all of us and say, you know, this is how a store should look. And you don't cram it. At that time in Bombay, we were running into an exhibition 
they be exhibition come sales and they try clothes over their shalwar kameez. Now you just work that out. What, how good is that for fit, okay? <laughs> Nothing fit, so even on a nara. So, you know, we fell on our face. I went with Sally Holker, we said, let's use chanderi. We did a whole collection, but Indian chanderi is woven to be draped. So every sleeve would tear after Ooh. two wears, right? It would fray. The count of the fabric has to be different for construction and to be put in a washing machine, let's say. We've fallen, I mean, we made every mistake. I don't think anyone has ever put a Tarun Tahelyani outfit in the washing machine. Well, back then they did, <laughs> in Chandeli. Well, even if you hand washed it. <laughs> but I'm just saying, you know, we, A, we were trying to learn fit, and B, we were working with fabrics that we had no idea about because they were woven to be draped. Today, there's a lot more technology, people know how to fuse, and actually it's the big stumbling, last stumbling block is that somewhere the government needs to work with our weavers who are doing amazing things, but upgrade so you can wear a pair of nice brocade pants and let it fit the way you expect the Western fabric to, because now once you're used to that, there's no going back. So, you know, you were just speaking about weavers. Are young people taking to traditional crafts? Like, would you say that the weavers you work with, what is their age group now? Like, are they older people? Are they younger people? I, I think that, you know, firstly, the ones whose children have stayed in the business, because the markets are much bigger, are tech savvy. So they'll come, in fact, I keep shouting, hey, jeans, you pen, they're all in their lovely shalwar kameez and banaras and I'm like, what are you dressed like this for? But anyway, everyone thinks that's progress, right? So it's you're in the big bag city and you dress like a city slicker. But I'm just saying that there is a huge movement of young designers working with weavers like Anna Villas or doing one amazing things. There's a lot of cool younger Indian women who, and men who, who kind of have some appreciation. Not a lot, there's so much out there that it's kind of, you know, it's mind boggling. But most of the people who stuck it, and the big thing they're doing, the weavers have switched to viscose from silk, which I've endorsed because otherwise they'd be out of business. I mean, how many people can buy 5,000 rupee meter brocade? But everyone can buy it for 800 rupees and it looks the same. So till the economy supports it, it's just changing the yarn. Don't cr crinkle your doors. It's only so that they can survive. Others, they'd be out of business. And the Chinese duplicate their designs and dump it in polyester, which is much worse. Uh, so this again brings me to something I was thinking about. That you know, we all talk about we want to support craftspeople. But how can the average person who cannot afford the brocades of the outrageous price you were just discussing do that in their daily lives? Like, what do you think possible? You know, it's not about brocade. Brocade is one end of it. I go to find people that I want to work with at Laila Tebji's Dastakar. And there's a lot of stuff that you could never buy in a mall at a price that you could never get. Because the crafts people are coming, you know, and this craft mela is the biggest thing around this country where our crafts people really work. Because they're not big enough to work in the big... You know, unfortunately, even Tata, though they have Tanera, they have so many conditions to fulfill that half the class people can't work with them, you know? Right. So that's unfortunately what happens with corporatization and, you know, when you have to basically adhere to what they call, you know, social, whatever. Actually, it's hurting some of the smaller people. But the craft milas are amazing. And that's why the crafts people got badgered during COVID. I mean, they were wiped out. They don't have, you know, they have like, enough silk in their house or cotton to weave two saris. They really live from month to month. I think if you just start being conscious of buying something that's made locally, whatever works for you. I mean, you get beautiful necklaces like that in the yes, grass. Thank bazaar. you, this is, yeah. And so, you know, that's it. You support it in your own way. We have 1.4 billion people. If three, 400 million are out shopping and buy something, it's enough. Right. You know, you are merging traditional Indian craftsmanship with contemporary fashion design. I think that is what Tarun Telyani is known for. But there must be a balance there, right? There has to be because you can't do everything. It's just when I say modern, it's about fit. We're used to a Western fit. Fit was not an idea in India before. If you're choli fit, most people still wear cholis that don't fit. Anyway, you're not used to anything else, you wear it. Uh, or a churidar was on the bias. But a lot of things that were made, unless they were very loose, and especially when you switch to ready to wear, buying ready-to-wear clothes because there's so many different body types and there's not been documented for India. Fit is an issue. Once you taste Western fit, which is all about fit, their clothes are about fit. The style is, you know, incidental or it's, you know, superficial on it. So to make these two things, I don't want to hear an Indian man say, oh my God, I didn't know that Indian clothes could be so comfortable. 
they're the most comfortable things. It's have to be made right. I'd go as far as saying they're too comfortable. Oh, well, <laughs> yeah. Well, and with the nara, you put on three yeah. kilos or 30 kilos. Still exactly. fits. Too it's very comfortable. very forgiving, like the sari. <laughs> Doesn't matter how much weight you put on or not, you still wrap the same sari. <laughs> uh, that's so, where you said that all women drape it differently and that's... Exactly. Uh, that, well, yeah. yeah. And you can go up and down and you can wear a grandmother sari even if she was that big and you're petite, no problem. Yeah, as long as she's that big and I'm petite, it's all exactly. fine. Exactly, yeah. as she was from what I know. So. <laughs> maybe, maybe more on that later. But you know, uh, what my grandmother wanted out of fashion would have been something which would have la lasted her from her trousseau till her children's wedding, right? And but as textile, it did. It did, of yeah. course. But I would say that today would, you know, nobody wants to repeat an outfit. And everything is for social media, everything is... Well, that's actually the tragedy of today, is social media. Because it's entrapped people in a projection. Either from being depressed because they think everyone else, like you said earlier, has the perfect life. Uh, I mean, we have our biggest socialites who wake up every day and get made up and wear wigs and different clothes and get photographed. That's what they do for a living. And it's horrifying. And Bollywood also perpetuates this scary myth with their, you know, they're b apparently borrowing clothes to walk through the airport because now you have paparazzi at the airport. So they borrow a bag or this thing and they'll pose and it'll be on pinkvilla.com or something. So it's all That's oddly I'm, specific, Tarun. You seem to know a lot about no, no, no. it. No, no, I'm just saying, of course I have to know about it because I have this big fight going on. And they're like, you've got to get a showstopper. And I said, no, I won't get a showstopper for the show. So I put a girl and covered her head and embroidered showstopper and we got a standing ovation because, you know, they, they want 90 likes, but they're endorsing another brand, so they can't post. I'm like, you know what? Stay in Bombay. <laughs> we'll I, I think we're getting to the gossipy part of the session. It's not gossipy. Okay. It's no, serious question. <laughs> Do people harass you for free clothes and say, all we're going to put them on Instagram and we'll have following of whatever thousands? All and the time, all the time. So that's the new influencer buzz. I mean, at least the actresses really have, uh, you know, giant followings, 50, 60, 70. But, you know, half of them, or most of them might not even be relevant. And the fact is that, unfortunately, till you have a style, so if you wanted to, if you saw something on Rekha, which was a conjurer, you might say, wow, because that's her style. But if you tomorrow, in, you saw her in a bikini, you're not likely to say, oh, I want that, because you don't associate it. And that's what's happening with a lot that's of the That's going to be a great picture for Pink Villa, though. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, she's too cool. She won't do that. She knows she's the master image manager. No, and she does it with authenticity. So I'm just saying that there's unfortunately this whole thing where social media is just being used and twisting people's perception of what, how they need to live, of themselves. Um, it's not great for quality. Things have to be big and bold and graphic, others they don't show. And that's not how luxury works. Because luxury is about finesse and fine, and it doesn't show on a phone screen. But I think, you know, people are getting smarter and with it, they're understanding. And we Indians are too smart. So, you know, they that figure it out and move on. So. That is indisputable. So, before a big Tarun Tehliani show, what's the energy like? Like you said, you know, you uh, declined to like, have a show. Like stuff. we were backstage. Come ahead, shut your head, say, oh my God, are we mad? Were we crazy? Because you work for six months and that shows 20 minutes. Oh my God. And anything can go wrong. And forget that. That's when you give up control. Because the model steps out. You photograph it, depending on what you see and how you put it out, that's what the world is going to see. So actually, it's like, you know, standing with a noose around your neck and someone's about to pull the hangman chain, literally. Sounds fun. Yeah, um, it's not. <laughs> so, you know, when you say that uh, models are uh, sort of on the ramp and your clothes are out there, tell me one thing, genuine question, why don't models smile? Like, why do they always look so upset? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we Indians just laugh too much. <laughs> yeah, look at us laughing away. Well, this whole thing of the model as the mannequin started in Paris and in the old days where they were only couture salons and Chanel and Dior would show every month and a model would walk with a placard and somebody would read out the description. And they were meant to be human bodies showing clothes because clothes, after all, are more beautiful in movement than on a mannequin. But when they start to smile and ham and you can't control it, it kind of goes, careens out of control. So you just, you want it to focus to be on the garment, on the movement and on the imagery. And you know what? A lot of them look damn good even if they don't smile. <laughs> I love Naomi Campbell when she's not smiling. You know, I, it does project a certain hauteur and this and that, but 
that's the bite. You so, know. so then the model has to be, in a sense, unattainable and inscrutable. Is well, that what I think that's know? become the consequence. What the model has to be with Shamoli Varma and the other girls who grew up before the time when they watched FTV and tried to copy something, they had their own personalities. Madhu came, Madhu Sapre came from some, you know, she talked like this, and which once she stepped on, it didn't matter. She possessed something that she projected, you know. Uh, Meher Jaisal could transform something. So that's what they need. And you want them to have their own personalities, but don't be smiling away. They I mean, just smile can't smile. Like, smiling is an emotion. Just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, when you say that, I recently saw the Zara ca uh, catalog online. I was buying something. I bet you haven't seen the Zara website. Uh, you want to send help to those girls, okay? <laughs> like, you know, the way they're kind of... In, in, a, in still yeah. photography, we make them smile a lot because you can choose the photo, right? Because, you know, I sh you don't know... It's to control the photographer's image if they're right, that, still... Right, that makes sense. You can control it. So, you know, we've gone to models and smiley. Let me try and bring us back to your book, which uh, the concept of India modern. Tell me, tell me about that. Like, what does it mean? Like, it's something you've evolved well, you through see, your character. Well, uh, through well, your, uh, it's something career. I've always been interested in, and I've always been interested in technique and fit. And I didn't grow up knowing all this about. Martan Singh gave me that beautiful book, Vishwakarma, and I started driving around different clusters in India and seeing things like, you know, chicken workers or in Kutch. But the whole idea of being India modern is, I don't want India to be Western, and then at a wedding, everyone looks like, you know, there's some costume ball, which is kind of happening right now. Yeah. So India modern has to be where we find, and designers have to do it, solutions where you can wear a cool white shirt with a chicken collar and wear it with something to make it modern. So let's say, uh, what's the brand? Um, Nicobar is trying to right. do that. It starts with great simplicity and you mixing and matching things that you create a hip look. Anoki's always had it. And finally, like your Western clothes, you've got to have many things in your cupboard that you just mix and match. It doesn't matter which brand it comes from. So India Modern for me is taking a wonderful craftsmanship, but not relegating it to the sari and the lenga, you know, that you wear to a wedding and thing. The how do we make it that it's more for an everyday life, if not to throw in the washing machine, since it offends you so much. We will get to that too. <laughs> but at least to be able to wear it to a nice dinner. And Indians dressed like that a lot 25 years back, but now it's either very Western, so that the... I mean, Ritu Kumar said to me one fashion week, she said, they invite all these white buyers, and then, you know, they come and say, it's too much color, too much this, and I feel embarrassed to put a sari on the Indian ramp. Can you think of anything more absurd? We, all, we don't have to look for endorsement outside. We're going to find... Fashion must find solutions for our life, and if we want to integrate our craft, then we have to find a modern take. Or it'll stay in the realm of costume that you dress up as Joe Dagbar and dance. That's fine, too. I'll look, I'll look. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, no, I know that in this pursuit, you've been through a lot of unusual techniques and it's been a lot of trial and error and a lot of... Um, there is something I read about in your book called bearing, not called, but bearing fabric to achieve a pati patina. Tell me about that. I, I, I personally love the patina, you know, I mean, you can't help it in India. The patina of dust, which is not being dirty, but just there's a toned down thing of the way, you know, Anjali Ila men in paintings have it. And there's just a certain patina of India, not this chemical bright fluorescent color. That's actually not really Indian at all. We started with vegetable dyes, right? So sometimes we look at something in our printing and say, it's just too bright, what do we do? So we have two things. Either you dip it in a tea solution, or we've got a huge flower bed outside, which we bury it in and take it out the next morning and wash it. Thoda mitti lag jai uspar, and then you see if that's the right color, then you find out how to do it, so that every production piece doesn't go into the flower bed. But that's okay. That would make it very expensive. <laughs> but I mean, R&D has to happen. The main thing we spend time on is fit. So we work in the classical way of Western ateliers, where you make sketches, you make the kora kapra that's called a tual, and then once a week a model comes and she'll try it and say, this should have more ease, this should be, can you lift your arm? What, what would you do in this jumpsuit if you had to go to the loo? Because it's about practical things. Sometimes you don't have the answer. So yesterday the girl said, we just have to take off our jumpsuit. Don't put a zipper down there. I said, fine. Yeah, that is women <laughs> suffering for fashion, absolutely. <laughs> well, um, they say the jumpsuit is very liberating. You can cross your legs and I, sit how you want. <laughs> so I don't know, different views. I think we'll ask, wait for the audience to ask a question whether the jumpsuit is liberating or not. I would, okay. I would differ with you on that. Um, 
Yeah, no, but now what is the next big thing, Tarun, after the concept sari and all these different kind of things, you're always evolving. Sir, so we have where a little video, I'll make them play, where yeah, based where on these video? Ravi Verma, you know, these beautiful Navar sari, the nine yard sari, we've done dhoti jumpsuit. So it looks cool. like a dhoti, but a palla, it's on a zip. And we're showing you this video that you can wear with the jile, you wear it with the jewel t-shirt. Everyday fashion has to come down to beautiful separates that you mix and match. And it can't be only Western. We have to find it with the Indian. So Anoki, you can sort of do it, you know. Right. Fab India, less so, but you know, you can't be Fab India only if you wear that churidar or that thing. So the next big thing to free aged women and men is to give them cool separates, like the man's bundi. We buy it, we wear it with anything. It just ties there, you know, you dress it up, you dress it down. And in just one country where if a woman wears a cotton sari, at the first fashion week, I gave a quote, I said, some of the most beautiful women in this country don't know what a designer is, and they don't need to know. They wear handloom, they wear kajal, they wear fresh flowers, maybe silver, and they're like, what's the point of giving this quote? I mean, we're doing fashion week. I said, but this is where we are now. To bring that freedom into the Western separates that speak Indian, like an Italian looks Italian, the French look French. I don't know what we Indians look like when I'm at the airport anymore. <laughs> but at a wedding, they look terrific. But at the airport, you know, thoda, yeah, it's little like, garbar ho gaya. So we have to see. You know, it's interesting you say this because I could imagine, like, I have my grandmother's sarees, my grandchildren, if, uh, you know, we get that far. Yeah, you, uh, yeah. What will they have of mine? Jackets? Like, what Indian fusion but, you things? Know, I've seen you, just because I know her from outside this chat. You wear cool little jackets, you know. Little velvet. They're cool things. They might wear them in their teenage years uh, with jeans. They might wear it later with a sari. But we got to show them that it's cool. Yes. We haven't done that enough. You know, and unfortunately in today's world, more and more that's the norm because the choices and the variety and the imagery out there. I mean, I don't even know how you've got to process it. I'll process things by blocking, 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 blocking. Because <laughs> you have to process it in here. Everything can't come from outside. That's not processing. You know, it's interesting you say that because I would say standing where you are, is it safe to say you've seen it all in the Indian fashion industry? No. Seen you know, I, I love Naipaul Squad. A million mutinies, a billion mutinies. People are interpreting things their way. I go to the Kum. I'm so excited. I'm going Jan 15. Anyone wants to come? I'm at the Kum Mela, mm -hmm. running around with a photographer, watch, just taking photographs. And there are even women who come amazingly dressed with gendas and jade. It's insane. I mean, these are people who have no money, no idea of fashion. Although, I was in an Akhara the night before, and there's a Nag Sadhu, as you know. This is all going too fast, Tarun. You were in an Akhara the day before. Yeah, and, and this guy, someone told me, I'm a designer. They run, they open the kum, the Nag Sadhus run first, and they're naked, covered in ash. But he Very still fashion. wanted me to come and help him decorate his wire mukhat. Ki kya laha lagao, kya waha lagao. And I'm like, man, fashion's alive at the kum. And they took a lot of effort for that opening within, having no money, nothing, but just, it was beautiful. You know, I'm really, I, I think- So you I know. haven't seen it all to answer your question. So I'm saying, you, that, you know, you're preempting my next question, which is how do you find excitement about your work having seen it all? Obviously that question is It's redundant. too exciting. And the more you do, the more you get into it and the more techniques you know how to, it's an evolution in your own head that's the excitement. Unfortunately, we have to judge ourselves by sales and this and this whole corporate world out there. But the excitement is going to the design studio where the new tools are being tried and see what this is good. It's a process. It's like an addiction, you know, I, but I love it. Well, I, I'm happy to <laughs> hear that there is as much ahead as has already gone. Absolutely. And I, feel I hope the best is yet to come. I, I think we should uh, open the floor sure. for questions now, if anyone has any questions. Uh, who has the mic? Yeah, please, this lady in pink at the front. Yeah. And then. Namaste, Tarunji. I think I, I don't know, since how many years I am really big fan of your fashion, I, and I always think about one thing that you use, like you use all the colors, but mostly the earth tones. Why? Is it your favorite or, I love earth tones. That's why I always like uh, looking your stuff and try to buy I it. actually like beige and ecru is my favorite color. Oh. But I think that when you're doing embroideries and a lot of multicolor, then shocking pink and lime green, although it might be beautiful on a kanji varam, doesn't work for my eye on 
an outfit that has a lot of intricacy and a lot of detail and motive. So if you're wearing hot pink plain, amazing. So just, you know, it's just a personal preference. And I think a lot of people in urban India are also toning down. A lot of brides are wearing ivory and beige uh, because they see we can use this again. So we, we're constantly changing, we as people. I mean, you know, there are other people who do brides, it's okay. Sorry, I'm going to ask one more question before I go to the next person to what this lady said about earthy tones. Brides don't want to wear red anymore, do they? I mean, just no, from social a, media, I've seen everybody just wearing these beige Well, clothes. they called it English colors. They're like, what's English about a beige? And, you know, what's English color? After you've gone blue in the face <laughs> saying, this is mitti, mitti, mitti. Mitti, mitti, English color. They will do English and they'll say, you know, should we get a makeup artist different? But each thing in egg then I'm gown. I said, You're not an actress. You're not Priyanka Chopra, who mm -hmm. one day is in a gown. They're actresses. Be yourself. You have one face. Let it look the way you are. Sure, you want to have you're wearing a youngster's party. But these silly notions get put into people's head by wedding planners and frankly a lot by Bollywood, you know. Right. I mean, hats off to um, what's her name? Alia Bhatt, who's the first person who said, Of course I'm going to repeat outfits. Who has 365 outfits? She's the first person in Bollywood who's come out and said that. And I say, wow, you know, you're going to free a lot of people who think that this fake value system is the right value system. Right, absolutely. Because you can't borrow clothes. I, I mean, of course you can have 700 outfits if you're borrowing lady, them. And then you can get to the gentleman in the front. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Sorry, I have a bad throat. No, uh, sound even better, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of talk about how the luxury market now is really coming from smaller and smaller cities, right? Whether you look yes. at all the pop-ups yes. that are happening there. So has that changed the way that you look at when you're designing? For no, because the smaller cities want to follow the bigger cities. And it's just that, you know, the action comes out of Bombay and Delhi, uh, to some degree Calcutta. But everyone's looking at the big cities and the big movie or the big wedding. Social media is a big thing. And India's becoming more, more homogenous. That's what television and social media and computer does because everybody, including your driver's kids, have access to that same information. So in one generation, there's a sea change and like the homogeneity I used to feel in America 35 years back because everyone watched the same, it's happening here. It's no difference. Nihal Krishan uh, here from Delhi. Uh, I was curious, is there anything in men's fashion that is new and unorthodox and maybe a little rebellious that you're trying to do, whether it's comfortable or not, whether it's easy no, to comfort be in or otherwise. Comfort is essential for men, that, that, I think. That, so. that, that you're trying to, to, to do or create that maybe hasn't had as much traction or that you're trying to persuade, you know, the, the, well, the, the, the male you, audience on. A, so like it, two or three pieces. Maybe. So Indian men became westernized much earlier than women because they went out into the workforce, so, you know, like my grandfather spoke English and wore suits, but my grandmother only spoke Sindhi or Hindi and wore saris at home, you know. So that happened. It's happened much later for Muslims because they were much more traditional. The women have just started going out in traditional communities. We're trying to bring a lot of the drapes back for men. And I love Rohit Ba's famous or infamous quote, quote that men were the real peacocks in India, which they were, if you look that at costumes so of Royal India. And now men are not getting, my uncles got married in single breasted suits on the floor, cross-legged with a sofa. They looked mad when I looked at the photos, you know. They looked a, a slightly demented actually. Because they, 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 the trousers didn't even have pleats. I don't know how they managed, you know. Now Indian men want to be Indian. They want to be experimental. You know, they've come into their own. So they're wearing drapes. They're wearing all sorts of asymmetry. So we play with a lot of that. And, uh, they're quite experimental. Some go too far, actually. I mean, I've been to weddings, they were like, oh my God, you know. So are men Seriously, they're more, they're more fashion boo-boos on men now than they're on women. And men are as into it as brides now? Grooms, they're as like, I, grooms -ish. Well, from what I see, they're not as groom, you know, a lot come in and just want something beautiful. And they're like, look, this is what I'm comfortable with. You know, men, for, for a lot of Indian men, you know, ornate Indian fashion is much more alien than it is for women. Because a lot of men can just wear a suit, the women will be in a lenga if they go to a wedding. And men have dressed like that. So the engagement and this perception that it's uncomfortable, but once they're into it, they feel great and they love it. It's changing, it's really fine, you know. I think that lady was next, and then this lady, is it 12, one, four, and, yeah. yeah. 
after this, we can take some questions at the back as well. I think we'll Hi. So my question is that, you, as you just mentioned, that people do not want to repeat clothes, yet there is so much talk about sustenance in fashion industry. So how that we can actually inculcate in real life? Well, I think that the first big thing you have to do, one has to think about, is buying things that one loves and reusing them. Love and Relove is a campaign we use. We even show bridles. It's totally fake to, you know, if everyone wants to photograph themselves in something new every day, First, there's a value system that's crazy. Even Kate Middleton is making a point of repeating clothes, even though they're from Zara or, you know, Topshop or whatever. So we have to get over that, you know, silliness. But 90 billion pieces of clothing from fast fashion go into landfills every year, even though there's huge parts of the planet that don't have clothes. And a lot of those clothes have a synthetic, you know, quotient, so they're not biodegradable. It's totally, there are two things. If you want to be sustainable, you have to reuse. And to reuse, you have to buy things you love that feel great on your skin. Not for the logo, not because some influencers put it out. And then you wear it. I have some sweaters that I love. And I make sure that I look after them so I can wear them again and again and again. And I don't give a damn how often I wear it. So <laughs> you shouldn't either. And that's actually bad for our business, but it's not. Because you'll buy more quality, beautiful things that have a story, not mass produced in a sweatshop somewhere in Southeast Asia or, you know, wherever it is, Bangladesh or India for that matter. Hi, Tarun. Hi. I was a proud Tarun Talyani bride back in 2008, and I wore my red with a lot of pride. Good. Um, now, Still I'm talking a, to me, must have looked good. Go, go on. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, now I'm a designer and my question to you is, in this uh, era of over-competition and over-availability in the market, and other than the Indian designers ourselves, we are competing with the entire world um, in, a, in a very difficult manner as everyone wants to become, you know, identical twins wearing Zara and H&M and just walking around like that. How does an Indian brand manage to stand out and at the same time stay sustainable but also economically viable? Well, you know, a successful fashion business is a culmination of many things. You need design, you need a point of view. People have to come to you for something that you offer them that they feel hundred other people won't because that's, the, you know, if you do black tights, you can't compete with Zara. But if you do a nice printed cape, then maybe you can, but it's a point of view. It needs an authentic story. I think f to be sustainable or the closer, you have to use fabrics and techniques that support it, obviously. And you have to have a good dose of luck. Listen, in India, everything is hyper competitive. Every, the big joke was that every auntie in Delhi had four tailors in her garage and was knocking clothes off, you know, at a time where they washed shalwar kameez. You can't, you can't fight that, just be better. Think about what's your differentiator. And you, like I said, you need some luck, go to Fashion Weeks. I have an ex-assistant, Asim Kapoor, who's doing great work. He's at every show in every city, these pop-ups that happen, and he's selling well. I mean, it's a very tough life till you get to a certain thing, and it's, and it's a hard business. Let me tell you, people are shocked. I'm out of the door at 7.30 in the morning. I work many Sundays. You don't have a choice. It's what it is. Pleasure. Hi, Tarun. Hi. Uh, my question is about inclusivity and how you see inclusivity to be inclusive in the near future. When I say inclusivity, I also mean, will you be creating gender neutral clothes? Or inclusivity, why your models are still very slim where not anybody can relate to? Okay, can I answer? Yes. Firstly, Indian clothes have always, a lot of them been gender fluid. Today, women wear dhotis, they were men's clothes. You can wear a dhoti, you can wear a kalidar kurta, you can wear a kurta with a drape. Maybe not quite a mini skirt, but certainly a lot of the Indian clothes we do are in a way, when they're simple form, they're gender fluid. We keep getting stuck with this term, this terminology from the West. We've always had it. Like when they talk about, uh, you know, stuff that's, uh, 
I don't, can't remember the word, we always cook fresh food, we do this, you know, everything is organic here, a lot of it, right, if you don't buy it. The other thing is that, you know, unfortunately we do fittings a day before, so like I explained with the non-smile question that she posed, you just need one body type to, you know, because you're fitting the day before. If I have to use people who are different sizes, there's no problem. In my shoots, I've used them from 12 years. I mean, Janti Dugal shot for me, you know, Mona Maya, she's 78 with white hair. She's one of our most fantastic models. She's not a model, but I love her spirit. So we've used it. It's just when you have 24 hours to show, because we are showing fit. And, you know, we've had to do this at Lakme, and they'll suddenly put Sakshi Savlani, and there's no blouse, and then you have to do some jugad, and it, it doesn't work. You have to show fit, you need to have the sizes before, that's all. So my question is a little different, not about the fit to a body. I'm talking about inclusivity as a concept. Accepting everybody. In I the think this might be a separate session in itself. Yes. So maybe we can take that question up another time. We have two more questions. Uh, let's One put it lady this way. If people come into the studio, we don't care about body type. Our job is to make them look beautiful and comfortable. We don't, actually, There's fashion is one of the questions. most inclusive industries or anything. Yeah, two questions. Tarun, we have exactly three minutes before we're evicted from the stage. Okay, Let's well, you, you can evict me anytime. Mindful of that. Two yeah. questions are coming up. Great yeah. to hear you, Tarun. My Thank question you. to you is here. Hi. Yeah. Ah, okay, hi. My question is, how, does, how, do you, how do I evolve my style? Well, I think you have to see what works for you. You have to be true to your own style. And really, style is a personal thing, and it's the only thing that endures. Don't worry about fast fashion. And Indian style has always been timeless. Be true to that self. There's too much over influence and pressure. Just block it. That's a start. I think maybe two more questions if you're quick. One over here, and I think there was a lady there as well. Hi. You can start. Yeah. So my question to you is that what was your big kick? Like everyone gets their big kick now when they are going to turn successful. What was your kick? Well, my big, for me, a big giant stress and a big thing that really felt uh, overwhelmingly exciting for me was when I showed in Milan on the ramps that all the other big designers showed. I mean, I was super stressed about it. That was a huge kick and to be accepted and to sell in all the stores. But then in two years, I said, you know, but I don't know anything about their winter. What am I going to do as an Indian designer sitting here? And I understood you have to design for the life you live if you want design to be relevant because design is about solutions for a life. It's not some, you know, airy-fairy thing. And we live in a country of 1.4, the Pakistanis love us, Bangladesh love us, the Arabs are beginning to, it's a lifestyle we get. So I don't really care and I don't want to design for what someone will wear to a black tie in Boston. It's not my problem. If they want to wear something we do, great. That's it. This would be our last question. Thank you so much, Tarun. This has been an amazing session. Thank you, Tarun. It has been lovely hearing you. Thank I have you. a question uh, that, uh, you know, where do we see regional uh, fashion coming in into the global fashion? Well, you know, actually, unfortunately, for things to go into the global fashion, it has to work in their lifestyles, like I said. So a lot of Indian workmanship has gone abroad. It's beginning to go in its final form because a lot of Indian ethnic fashion or what we do as bridal and the hind is not relevant, a beaded coat maybe. But I think we have a lot of work to do because we're switching from a, a drape tradition to clothing within our country and the Indian diaspora, which is huge and growing and successful and love it. And it's now spilling out. Every time there's a wedding, all the Americans want to wear Indian fashion. So it's we inch that way, they inch this way. It's not going to be mainstream in their life in New York. It's not relevant. But for a certain kind of occasion and party and celebration, we're inching there very well, and we are great workmanship for many communities and designers, so we've gone that way. Tarun, thank you so much. This has been a very engaging conversation. Thank you.